welcome yet again to Dispatches from India, a show by People's Dispatch, where we bring you some of the major news developments of the past week, the issues Indians are talking about, and the impact they will have on politics, economy, and all aspects of life. For foodies, India is a veritable paradise with substantial differences in cuisines across geographies. But food is also deeply political in India, closely associated with religion and caste. Over the years, it has also been used as a tool for polarization in various parts of the country. There have even been incidents of people being lynched on charges of carrying or storing beef, as a section of Hindus believe that the cow is holy. Recently, we saw another instance of the politics of food being played out at the Jawaharlal Nehru University, one of India's leading institutions in the capital, New Delhi. Students belonging to the Akhil Bharatiya Vidyarthi Parishad, or the ABVP, which is associated with the ruling Bharatiya Janata Party, reportedly attacked fellow students. Now, this was because meat was being cooked in a hostel mess, on the day of a Hindu festival. Despite the students agreeing to serve the meat only once the rituals were over, the ABVP group refused the bargain and took to violence. Here is a ground report. In the hostels, there is non-veg food served to the students. There is also veg food served to the students. In Kaveri Hostel, at 1 o'clock, the vendor comes to chicken deliver. The ABVP gunders are going to kill them. स्कूल लेकर जो वहाँ के रेजिडेंट हैं, वो मेस वार्डन से मिलने जाते हैं, बोलते हैं कि हमारा जो खाना है, वो आज क्यों नहीं बन रहा है? तो वहाँ से पता चलता है कि ना वार्डन से कोई परमिशन है, ना कोई डीन ऑफ स्टूडेंट से परमिशन है। हमने उनसे बातचीत करने की कोशिश की कि देखो रामनवमी के अंदर ऐसा था तो मीट को लेके आप इस तरह के का मतलब इम्पोजिशन नहीं लगा सकते स्टूडेंट्स पे लेकिन उसी दौरान उनपे एवीपी के गुंडे अटैक करते हैं उनपे भी अटैक करते हैं तो हमने दिल्ली पुलिस को कंटिन्यूअसली कॉल किया तब जाके दिल्ली पुलिस साढ़े नौ बजे आई और वहाँ पे भी दिल्ली पुलिस आके दिल्ली पुलिस के सामने लोग बच्चों को पीटा जा रहा है और पुलिस बोल रही है कि हम क्या कर सकते हैं जहाँ पे उनको बचाने की जरूरत है जहाँ पे स्टूडेंट्स भाग के उनकी वैन की तरफ आ रहे हैं वहाँ पे भी उनका कोई प्रोटेक्शन नहीं मिल रहा है। But that is not where the story ends. The following day, university students from Delhi and Ambedkar universities together with their JNU colleagues marched down to the Delhi police headquarters. They assembled to voice strong protest at police inaction in dealing with the violence on campus. Instead of getting a hearing, this is how the capital's police responded. What happened yesterday in JNU was clearly the adaptation of the uh, vegetarian Savarna uh, like ideology into the freedom, the, the, into the democratic space of the campuses. It is a fact that JNU, uh, JNU Social is actually providing protein rich food, non veg and veg. Uh, considering non veg, they are providing protein rich food, and, and, uh, and with respect to veg, veg also, they are providing protein rich food to non veg, uh, non -veg eaters and veg eaters. So, this, the common students don't have any problem with that. So the ABVP, uh, they deliberately created this particular issue by uh, disrupting the, the, the life of common students. The ABVP people do a lot of children to threat that if you are working with the Dalit, you will get out of here, we will see you. Uh, if a girl sees you, this is a threat, this is a threat. This is a threat. Constant threat है हमारे लिए कि वो हमारे घर पे पहुंच के अगर हम पे कल attack कर दे हमारे घर घर वालों पे attack कर दे anyways police भी इस पे कुछ react नहीं कर रही है तो ये बहुत बड़ा डर है हमारे लिए In keeping with the theme of food and politics in stories from India, we move on to tea, a once alien but now ubiquitous part of the country's culture. The southern state of Tamil Nadu, particularly the Nilgiri Hills, is among the country's biggest black tea producers. Tea companies in the state make millions of dollars in profits. But the living and working conditions of the people have steadily deteriorated over the years. Unable to bear the harsh working conditions and poor pay, many have migrated to the plains. Last year, the state government, that's of Tamil Nadu, increased the minimum wages for plantation workers. But the private estates are not implementing it. A trade union is waging a struggle for and with the workers who remain. 
We had earlier covered some of the issues regarding workplaces, and here is what these workers have to say on the issue of wages. Asam tea, China tea, la, in the other one, the corona pitala, erangal and solite, in the tea, and Allah chelse. About Nala chelse on a quarantinala, English chambla, woke upon us, and the chambla, the chambla, company of Pathe, and Kurkona. Ananga curt to me and the company in Lakidarin Kurkola, Kakonda. Corona Kalatal Valas in Tana, either one the Vasaya Pair, Abdin Sule, Apumanga, Vermana, the third in Allah, Walasitan Gutrubra. Corona Padika Potter, Tamla, Padipa Kasani, Edmilla, Corona. Lockdown, Pandu, Chenongo, Corona, Irke, Ungal, Captain Sulis, and the Muni, Angla, Adachunongo, Purna, Sapa, and Kurtanga, Adam, Kanaka, a core of Nitanga. Mel Kaurmund, Sampala, Arivichanga, Purenda, which a pull in the Arivichanga, Arasanga, Arivich, Sampalataye, the company even the Kuruka, the Kurumba Yasan on Nitranga. Overcoming Lava Mula Sariana Labor, TS State of Porta, the Panapiranga, TS State, T in Kapi, Yalamala, Panapir, is the T even the Taili Valanjitra. Taili Panam Kurti Terke. The Corona Pirlam Paranga, Velinat learned the Yakma the Vandra and Nipatitan Mutatake. Upon the tea, when the Nalla Velaki with the Che. In the time moving in the bonus in the Versam Langle bonus, Eru the Versan Kurkala. Kerala, Portaloke, Ella, the Eru the Versan bonus, Arivichanga. Kerala, Anga Makal Nalla Kanga, Angsiranga. Ingi in the Walpara Telaka, one of Smar, Ella Maprita. Upon the Tolil Varin Angle over the Ponantanga. அப்ப <laughs> Uh, பாருங்களாரு சாலையாப்பாங்களோட்டுமே <laughs> And finally, while we're on the subject of the rich getting richer, the Forbes real-time billionaires list is out. And among the 10 richest people in the world are two Indians, Gautam Adani and Mukesh Ambani. At the same time, surveys show employment levels in March 2022 have hit yet another low. Other surveys have said that more than 80% of households in India lost sources of income for one reason or the other. This extreme inequality is both visible and very dangerous. Senior journalist Anandya Chakravarti asked this question, is India ruled by the rich? Forbes magazine comes out with its annual rich list and it also on its website has a real-time top 10 billionaires list which gets updated every day. Now, out of those 10 top billionaires in the world, two are Indians, Gautam Adani and family and Mukesh Ambani. There are seven Americans, one Frenchman and two Indians. Now, maybe many people are feel proud about that, they, we've made it. Our people are amongst the richest in the world and that means that we are very prosperous as a country. But uh, one would have probably believed that had it not been for the fact that around the same time, Mahesh Vyas of CMI has come out with some stark data about unemployment in India. Uh, unemployment in March reached probably the highest level it has since the second wave ended. And by unemployment, I don't mean the unemployment rate, but the number of people who don't have work. Total number of employed right now is about 39.6 crore. That's the March 2022 data, which is lower than what it was in January and February 2022. Remember, the second, third wave, not second, third wave of COVID actually hit us in January and February. And by March, most restrictions were gone. And there was talk that things are coming back to normal. Everyone's out at work. Construction is taking place all around me. 
in Delhi NCR, I see construction taking place. So there appeared to have been a lot of economic activity taking place. And especially if you hear about what is happening in the startup and the tech space, you'll think that things are back to being extremely prosperous and positive. But employment is lower in March than January and February. Pundits call it the two Indias, right? That there is one India which is prosperous and there's another India which has lagged and not been able to catch up. And it appears that as if these two Indias are like that because they operate in two different ways. But that's not true. It's the same policies, same system which has made this into two Indias. It's actually one India. The rich, a handful of rich are becoming richer and the rest are becoming poorer or staying where they are because of the same system which is causing it. And the core of this system is what has been called the LPG reforms or liberalization, privatization and globalization. Liberalization is essentially where the state which had restricted entry to private entrepreneurs in some core sectors which it wanted to control, which it thought was essential for the economy and for society and nation, that was opened up to private companies. Another thing that is important part of liberalization is that earlier big companies were restricted when it came to having uh, you know presence in allied sectors. So if you have if you had a big company, if you were a big company in one sector, you had certain restrictions in another sector which would be allied so that you could not control large parts or large sectors. Those restrictions were gradually lifted. Now, the second thing that we talk about, which is privatization, which is actually closely allied and a corollary of liberalization itself, is that the government withdrew, the state withdrew, and public resources, public assets were sold to private entities. And the final part of this LPG reforms is globalization, which is essentially earlier there were restrictions for the entry of uh, foreign capital and foreign goods. You couldn't import things so easily and foreign companies couldn't invest in India. And from the 1990s, those restrictions were gradually lifted. LPG, which was supposed to essentially unleash the entrepreneurial spirits of Indians, right? And they were supposed uh, to uh, make people, uh, enable them to show their talents, start new businesses without any restrictions, make it easy for them to start new businesses. And if they got rich, if they made profits, they would buy things, they would employ people. And in that process, they would set off a virtuous demand and supply cycle. They would set off a virtuous employment cycle. They would get richer and that would trickle down to others who would get prosperous as well. And India would become a prosperous nation like the developed world. Of course, uh, unfortunately, capitalism does not work in that fashion. What happens is that those with capital always have a starting advantage. They are able to price out smaller businesses with their holding power. If a smaller business tries to enter a particular sector, a big company which has a lot of money and deep pockets can keep prices low and ensure that the small business is unable to compete. And that business either has to uh, vacate that space, shut down or become a supplier or a vendor to this big client. So that is how privatization causes big companies to become even bigger. Money begets money, capital begets capital, money flows towards money and makes it even uh, bigger. This is essentially the three-pronged thing that has caused extreme inequality in India. And that is the problem. Because India has increasingly become a country which produces goods and services for the richest people and for just about uh, the upper middle class maybe, there's a, amount beyond the, there's a limit beyond which demand cannot increase. So it is consistently, constantly constrained where it comes to demand and there is no reason why rich companies would want to expand production. So big companies are simply taking over other areas looking for places to consolidate and that is causing even bigger discrepancy between the poor and the rich. Some say that India is already a plutocracy, a state or a society which is run and governed by the rich. Even if it isn't, it is in grave danger of becoming one unless there is a rethink, unless there is a political movement to stop that, unless the government 
decides that it has to bring in policies which equalize things. That's the only way in which democracy can continue to be a real democracy in India or else we will become a plutocracy. That's all we have time for in this episode of Dispatches from India. We'll be back next week with more such stories. Until then, keep watching People's Dispatch. Thank you.